Welcome everyone to the very first um, virtual conference of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy. This is something of an experiment for us. We have traditionally over the past 30 years done an in-person conference. And of course, like everyone else, we have been uh, sucked into the COVID monster. Uh, and so we, we're, we're trying this. We hope it will work out well. Please bear with us because <laughs> There may be technical glitches from time to time. Um, we're not doing this to mess with you. Uh, we're going to try to make this as seamless as possible. But we are delighted to have been able, in a very short period of time, to try to put something together that we think will be both uh, quite relevant and hopefully provocative uh, and get people thinking and talking. Um, we will. Uh, the, the conference is organized uh, in six panels, each of which you are free to register for. We decided to break them up rather than to keep them um, together so that you have some flexibility in your choices. Eventually, hopefully, all of the videos of all the panels will be available in one form or another. And we hope that if you can make this, this is great. If you can't, uh, you may see the videos and, of course, uh, we at the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy more, are more than happy to welcome your questions afterwards. And with that short introduction, it is my pleasure to, to kick this off by introducing our extraordinary president who has, whose vision has made this possible. Uh, you see, I can do this from time to time. <laughs> our extraordinary president who's made this, this possible, and I thank her for her, uh, her vision. This is Silvia Pedraza who's a professor of sociology and American culture at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And her research interests include the sociology of immigration, race and ethnicity in America, as well as the sociology of Cuba's revolution and exodus. There's a whole lot more. I could spend the next hour talking about Sylvia's work. All of the conference bios are up on the conference website, which you are welcome to look at. Uh, suffice it to say that in, in this case, my interview of Sylvia that we did before the conference is really worth listening to, to, um, to listen to a really interesting perspective on the waves of Cuban migration out of the island between 1959 and now. And without further ado, I turn the program over to our president. Uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. Uh, as you have said, for the last two years, I have been proud to be the president of the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy. And I like to add, and society. ASCII has a very nice acronym. Uh, the reason I like to add and society is because ASCII's mandate is quite broad, and it now encompasses not only the work of economists who were its founders and still constitute the bulk of its members, but it also houses engineers, lawyers, architects, sociologists, uh, and political scientists. All of these are people who work on issues related to Cuba under the revolution and also its diaspora. And as we know, the diaspora is now about 25% of the Cuban people. And they're people who reside not only in the United States, like most of us do, but also in Spain. You will see a Cubano Español, Elias, uh, in this session. Puerto Rico, Mexico, Costa Rica, Canada, you name it. Lots of places where there is a large Cuban presence. Our mission in ASCII is to promote research, publications, and scholarly discussion on the Cuban economy in its broadest sense, including the social, economic, legal, and environmental aspects of a transition to a free market economy and a democratic society in Cuba. ASCII is committed to a civil discussion of all points of view. ASCII is a nonprofit, nonpolitical organization that was incorporated in the state of Maryland in 1990. Thus, this year marks its 30th anniversary of sustained study of the Cuban economy and society. The coronavirus pandemic prevented us from holding our conference on these dates at Florida International University, FIU, in Miami, as we were ready to do, but we still hope to hold it there on January 4th through 6th, 2021. So stay tuned through our website, uh, which is ASCIIcuba.org. So you can get updates and see if we can make the FIU conference in January. Uh, stay tuned. 
ASCII is affiliated with a number of professional associations of the United States, such as the American Economic Association, the Allied Social Sciences Association, and the Latin American Studies Association. ASCII also makes a point of maintaining professional contacts with economists and social scientists inside Cuba, whether independent or associated with the Cuban government those who are interested in engaging in scholarly discussion and research. For many years, Cuban economists and social scientists have participated in ASCII's annual conference, as you will see today, bringing the important perspective of those who live and work there. As with everyone else, this year's pandemic forced us to rethink and reorganize how we carry out our work, so this is our first virtual conference, and I suspect that it may not be our last. The pandemic also brought us our theme, Cuba from the Castros to COVID, which we will consider over the course of six sessions in three days. Please remember that you have to register for all six sessions if you want to attend the whole conference, but you may also register for only a couple of sessions as you wish. Videos of the conference will afterwards be available to those who are ASCII members. So please become a member. <laughs> and the information is in the ASCII website, ASCIIcuba.org. Uh, today, while the panelists speak, you can send us your questions or comments. In the Zoom box where it says more dot dot dot, there is the option of Q and A. If you click on it, you can then type your questions to the panelists. And at the end of the presentations, we will take as many of these as we can in the end. So before I turn to introducing the members of our first panel today on the Cuban economy and prospects after COVID-19, I want to thank those who have worked hard, and I can assure you that it has been very hard work to make this the first virtual conference possible. Only a few months ago, most of us were not uh, able to handle video conferencing. We have learned it on the fly. We have learned it because as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. And in Cuba, the running joke is that the mother may have been necessity, but the father was Fidel Castro. Uh, I especially want to thank all our panel participants. And I particularly want to thank Larry Cata Baker and Frank Carlos Martinez, who is with us behind the lines, as well as our website master, Mike Perio. Without their efforts, this virtual conference would not have been possible. So Larry will now introduce me and I will then introduce each of our panel members. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, um, I'm, I'm really jazzed about this and I hope that um, our attendees will find this interesting and useful over the course of the next three days. We start with the Cuban economy and its prospects uh, during and after COVID-19. Uh, this is a particularly interesting topic because it is a really, it's a moving target. Uh, and both Cuban economists, sociologists, political figures and the like within Cuba and outside of Cuba wind up facing a different set of parameters almost on a daily basis. So um, we, with that caveat, I think that we're going to have a, a very, very interesting discussion. Um, a number of our panelists have uh, submitted their papers and have been willing to share them with folks. The papers will be on the website uh, and, uh, or PowerPoints. And with that, uh, I would like to introduce our panel chair, again, Silvia Pedraza, who have already introduced. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, okay, so I'm going to do, introduce Larry and Yudi, uh, who will present the first paper, Cuba's response to COVID-19 and the consequences for Cuba of the pandemic. Larry Kata Baker is a founding member of the Coalition for Peace and Ethics, and he serves as the W. Richard and Mary Eshelman Faculty Scholar, Professor of Law and International Affairs at Penn State that is Pennsylvania State University, but fondly known as Penn State. He teaches and researches in the area of globalization, including public and private law systems and the emerging forms of data-driven governance. 
Larry has written extensively on the emergence of 21st century Marxist-Leninist political and economic orders in China and Cuba. In addition to many articles, he has published a book called Cuba's Caribbean Marxism, Essays on Ideology, Government, Society, and Economy in the Post-Fidel Castro Era, and his latest article is Popular Participation in the Constitution of the Illiberal State, Popular Engagement and Constitutional Reform in Cuba and the Contours of Cuban Socialist Democracy, published in Emory International Law Review with Flora Sapio and James Corman. We also have with us today, uh, Yuri Gonzalez Hernandez, who is a Cuban lawyer, uh, uh, from the University of Havana, uh, who is currently in residence at Penn State, where he is working on his LLM degree. Before his arrival at Penn State, Yuri Gonzalez Hernandez worked as legal, legal advisor to different Cuban companies and the tax office of the Office of the Historian of the City of Havana, which is very important. Since 2016, he has provided legal advice to self-employed workers and has also participated in nonprofit entrepreneur projects aimed at the development of some communities in the city of Havana. You guys. Thank Mary you. Mary and Yuri. All right. Um, and for this presentation, Yuri will be doing the, the presenting. So okay. take it away, Yuri. Sorry okay. about that. Can you hear me okay yes. right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yuri Gonzalez, as Sylvia and Professor Baker said. Um, we are going to make a short presentation about Cuba is the, the main goal in this conference. And let me share. Okay. My screen to present the PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's talk just about Cuba respond to COVID-19 and the consequence, the consequence from Cuba of the pandemic. So uh, in this context, we will be focused on on the this this situation and the strategies that the Cuban government has taken. Uh, in this period, and this kind of uh, controversial situation between economics and health policy, and also uh, pay attention about how the people this situation and the future if this situation is going to continue. So, um, Cuba as a island. Uh, have been involved in this kind of uh, economical situation and the COVID-19 also uh, came to, to left a mark, but not positive in this way, uh, negative because uh, it has been attended uh, directly straight to, to the economy. Uh, let's make a short overview about the the pandemic. So uh, Cuba, despite, despite the, being a country with a good health care system, was, was on the country, uh, one of the countries that didn't take seriously the spread of the COVID-19 at the beginning. Uh, I say so because uh, at that time, uh, a lot of countries on, from Europe and China was facing this uh, difficult situation and Cuba and different agencies uh, are talking about tour operators start uh, began to promote Cuba as a tourist destination, ignoring the complex uh, world situation and obviously the foolish data that shows that the number of infections in different uh, European nations from which the tourists were arriving to the island. So uh, also Cuba held a, a cruiser ship that it was uh, requesting help in the Caribbean Sea because they have cases of COVID on board. So Cuba uh, give help to this cruiser ship and that is a good thing. The thing is that 
they didn't take the correct measure, high, high, hygienic measure to try to give help to these people and send the people to their countries. Um, so the, the pandemic started in Latin America uh, at the beginning of March. So uh, after March 10, Cuba start facing with this situation, mainly because uh, for the tourists. So they received three Italian tourists that came from Lombardy. Lombardy was the, the region of Italy that, that they have the highest number of cases. So since this moment, um, the number of cases in Cuba were increasing based on the infection, on how infectious is this virus. So that uh, brings us a consequence that the Cuban government has to take the correct measure and they start closing borders and developing treatment and start closing the, the work, the people, they, they suspend their public transportation and start to advise the people to be insulated at home and use the hygienic uh, measures. So, uh, and this was uh, for trying to stop the increased number of cases, but this is almost unstoppable because we didn't have a cure. So the core challenge in this uh, situation is that the tourist is a critical element of economy of Cuba for saying that is the main uh, uh, the main source that Cuba have for the economy so and this affects straight to the development plan for 2013 so and uh, now the expansion of non-state sector that depend of the tourists because they are the, the main market uh, I'm talking about restaurants, I'm talking about different souvenirs business and um, that have been affected in, in this situation. And this uh, address to the government to the government to encourage the local tourism, for example, uh, but it's so difficult because as we know, uh, local tourism, there is not economical prepare for fulfill this uh, market. And now they have to, to, to see what to do to make a, a new way, to find a new way to develop the economical uh, situation in this case. So let's talk a little bit about the Cuban medical internationalism. So um, since March, Cuba have been sending doctors and people who work in the healthcare system to different countries. And the initiative was motivated to the request of these countries to the World Health Health Organization, asking for support in this new situation that seems unstoppable. So this request, to this request, Cuba starts sending doctors uh, that today are more than 2,000 in more than 15 countries. But um, this has been well stepped in different countries, mainly in Italy, that it has been a good effect. The people really have been recovering and the, the, the program in Italy has been successful. Um, but it's a little controversial because uh, in some places uh, they didn't take this so well. Um, because some people says that this doctor have been uh, forced to labor. And it could be, maybe not. But the thing is that these people have been going to these uh, places and doing a good job because really I, I think that the war it wasn't prepared for to have a lot of uh, people in this situation. So that in another side, the, this have a negative situation from Cuba because now these doctors are coming back and some of them have been infected also. So, and that are cases 
that have to be attended in Cuba and have the potential uh, hazard that uh, it could be more people infected. So that is the, the two hand that we have to deal with it. So it's something that. <laughs> so uh, for, uh, in another side, we have the medical technologies that Cuba have been um, developing also. For example, uh, since 2007, Cuba produced the medicine called interferon, alpha 2B, uh, that is used for tried patients with higher cell leukemia, mal uh, malignant mel melanoma, and another kind of disease. This medicine has been produced under uh, a commercial name of Shang Herbert by Shang Shun uh, Biological Technology in China. This is the joint venture between Cuba and China. And uh, this medicine was used in China at the beginning and it ha uh, has a, a good result. So that the Commission of Health of China um, start to increase the development of, of the production uh, mm -hmm. based on the, the effectiveness on, on patients with the virus. Uh, in these countries, other in this context, other countries as Italy, Spain, and in Latin America, El Salvador, have been interested in buying this medicine uh, to use in the treatment uh, with to the patient with this kind of disease. So, challenge. We have a big challenge because in Cuba, as we know, it's hard to control the spread of the virus. First, because the sanitation measures. Uh, in Cuba, we have the, this situation that in a lot of places, we don't have the living condition. For example, in some neighborhoods, people doesn't have water daily to maintain uh, high, uh, the sanitation of the home uh, to keep everything clean as request for stop the, the spread of the virus. Uh, so that is a, a really challenge that the Cuban government have to deal with because have to be focused on take care of this population that need really help about it. And uh, about the food, is another challenge that the Cuba government has because uh, there is not enough for everybody. And also um, trying to buy this food, we are in, uh, we are not keeping the social distance because as a Cuban, in my case, if I'm gonna buy something, I have to make a long line. And it's so difficult for me to keep, to keep the social distance in, in a line for buying food. So this is a kind of difficult to, to, to get the food and stay uh, in social distance and insulated. So there is another challenge. And about economic reform, well, this is something new for the world, but there is not something new for Cuban people that we also have been dealing with special situation that sometime uh, in, in a time we call special period. So uh, now as a, another economical measure, the government have introduced again the dollar dollarization uh, to try to, to get some um, injection of capital and trying to, to find another way to develop the economic of economical system of Cuba. Well, uh, a kind of conclusion, Cuba have been among the states better able to meet the challenge for the pandemic and, and infection and morality, morality rates because uh, I have to say that Cuba have a good uh, healthcare system and have been concerned about the situation of the patients. I have been uh, monitoring the recovering of the patient and they 
the people that are reported as positive, they are not at home. They are in a place that the uh, epidemiologic, epidemiological institution have been prepared for these people. So there is not a risk for these people to infect another uh, people. Uh, but uh, there, is, there is not, that doesn't mean that we are, have been avoiding the, the pandemic because right now the cases are increasing again. So there is not just about how do you deal with the treatment to the infect people. It's about how do you deal with the people that are in the strip that they have to go to work, that they have to, to do the daily activities and you stop the spread of the virus in the society when that the people have to mm, go out to have the to take the take the food to make some money and that is kind of difficult even if you have to wait for the water because today is coming the water so you have to to fulfill your recipient and everything because the next day there is no water so that is another kind of challenge that in some way has exposed the weakness of the state because right now uh, the Cuban government has to try to stop to planning and start to think about something uh, more solid, something that they can do uh, adjust to the reality. And now it's difficult because now we are facing to a pandemic and it's a disease. So they have to be focused on the future, but not, not planning. So based on the reality. Well, um, with this, I think that if you have any question, um, if the Professor Baker has to add anything else, so. All right, well, thank you very much, Yuri. And, and uh, Sylvia, do I have a, a minute or two? Yes, to, please. To, all right. Um, no, thank you very much. And I've noted that there have been a number of really interesting uh, questions. I've tried to answer them in the, the Q&A window, and, and hopefully I was able to do that. Uh, I messed up the first couple because I pressed the wrong button. Uh, one of them was a, a, a welcome from a fellow Penn Stater, and hello, uh, thank you for <laughs> noting. And the second one was a question about the uh, percentage of the population uh, with daily water supply. The, the issue there, and I can just be very brief, and I think my colleagues from Cuba will have better information, but the, the answer, like all answers, is it depends. Uh, for some people, the, the problem is periodic, um, uh, uh, periodic problems with the water supply. For some, it's quality rather than the uh, availability of water supply. It will depend within Havana. There will be differences between Havana and the provinces. There will be difference. There will be significant differences between the west and the east of the country. Um, so it's all over the place. Um, I don't have the statistics, um, and hopefully either uh, Ricardo or Elias may be able to, to help in that uh, regard. There has been newspaper coverage about this, um, and there was in March and April, uh, where they, uh, reporters for a while went off to the countryside to interview uh, a number of people, uh, mostly people who were at home, who were complaining that the government was uh, creating all kinds, of the, the appropriate kinds of mandate, wash your hands all the time, wash your clothes, but there was either no facilities for hand washing or uh, soaps, the, the, the appropriate soaps were difficult to obtain or it was impossible to launder in the way that the, the government had urged. And that, that created uh, a little sense of controversy. Mercifully, um, it did not, uh, produce the kind of nightmare scenario that everyone was worried about uh, in terms of, of uh, spreading of disease. But what it does do, and, and this is my only point that I wanted to add to, to Yuri's excellent presentation, was that when you look at the issues that we've tried to highlight, um, the important thing is not necessarily its current effects, but what is really important is the way that COVID has actually shined a very, very bright light 
on the structural issues that continue to plague the way in which the government has chosen to implement its version of Marxist-Leninist state planning. And it has done that in a very specific way that is very difficult to avoid. Issues of sanitation are one. Issues of food and food security, which people have been talking around for years, is another. And then the issue of economic reforms. And we've seen, of course, um, the, the, the kind of return to the forms, although they say not the spirit of the special period. Uh, governments tend to move backwards when they are met with crises and to go back to their old toolkits to see what works in order to, uh, to try to ameliorate uh, some of the problems. And you're going to see this occurring not just with all, with all that COVID has done in a sense, is to show both the fragility of the Cuban economy, especially we, we've moved from sugar now to tourism, and the, the way in which a significant uh, blow to a pillar of the economy can have profound effects. But then it's also highlighted a couple of other things that people tend not to look at, even though it's very controversial. One is the exportation of key personnel. The medical internationalism, I think, is going to take on a very different sheen over the next couple of years. And then the second is uh, Cuba's attempt to leapfrog technologically uh, to a first world status, even though it remains a developing state otherwise. And, and with that, I'm done. I'll try to answer some, other, uh, some of the other questions that I see coming up. But thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to add that is some of questions that are here. Yes, for sure, this situation for the Cuban people, there is no new about the, the water situation, about the food situation, there is no new. We are talking about how worse is the situation during the, this COVID pandemic. And also because Cuba right now doesn't have that source that it was uh, uh, bring for the tourists. So now, this situation, it was before, but now it's worse. So that is the, the, the main point that we were trying to address this presentation, because it's, it's the big step that the Cuban government has to, to do for, in order to see what to do, what is the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Yudi, in particular, for a very uh, clear presentation. The slides were very good. And we'll come back later on to some of the questions if there is time. And I would like to now introduce our next presenter, who is Ricardo uh, Torres Perez. Uh, Ricardo holds a PhD in economics from the University of Havana. And in fact, he is right now in Havana from where he's speaking to us. He is a professor at the Centro de Estudios de la Economía Cubana, CEEC, the Center for the Study of the Cuban Economy, at the University of Havana. He has been a visiting researcher in numerous places, in Harvard, Ohio State, Colombia, Universidad de la República in Uruguay, the Finnish Central Bank, and Paris 3 Sorbonne Nouvelle. In fact, he was on his way to American University, Washington DC, when the pandemic hit, and he hasn't gotten there yet. <laughs> we'll, we have to wait and see if he will be able to get there. We hope so. He is the chief editor of a series of excellent papers called Miradas a la Economía Cubana, Views on the Cuban Economy. And he's also a columnist at Progreso Semana, Semanal, uh, which is Progreso Weekly. He is also part of the editorial board of the journals Cuban Studies and Temas, both. So this is Ricardo's uh, PowerPoint. Am I able to, to start? So hello, everyone. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Yeah, we're hearing you. We hear you. We hear you, Ricardo. Okay, perfect. Ya Sorry. Ya okay. I would like to thank uh, 
uh, Sylvia, uh, for the invitation, and also all my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. And so the situation is quite unusual, but uh, we'll make our best. And as Sylvia said, I'm in Havana right now. So if you have any question about how, you know, how is daily life in Cuba um, amid the pandemic, please uh, 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 make use of my uh, uh, status uh, as of now, but don't abuse the privilege anyway. So, um, you know, this panel is about Cuba's uh, economy in general and the impact of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I want to share some, some of my uh, views. This is it's actually based on a, on a paper that I submitted to a, a Latin American uh, uh, um, review. And it was published in Spanish. I will submit uh, in the coming weeks, the English version to, uh, to ASCII. So I also have to say that this is my first time participating in an ASCII conference. So I'm very happy to do it. Okay, let's start. So I'll mostly cover these three issues in my, in my presentation. So I'll talk a little bit about the current economic situation, then a little bit about how Cuba has handled the, 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 the impact of the, of the pandemic. And, you know, but the previous presentation said a lot about that, so I'll, I'll keep it short, mostly give you my opinion about uh, uh, the success of the country in that uh, regard. And I will conclude with some policy options discussing, you know, what's been announced uh, recently in terms, of, in, in, in terms of economic policy reform and what can we expect from those in, in the coming weeks and, and months. Um, so one, one of my points is that Cuba's economy was already in very bad shape uh, before the pandemic hit the country in March. Um, so we, go, we could, of course, you know, use lots of numbers uh, to, to, to make the point. But let me, ha let me say a few things here, which I think are important. So one is uh, that uh, there has been a contraction in export revenue since 2013, almost 30%, a third, and imports were down by at least 25% until 19, uh, until last year. So this year so far, according to Cepal's uh, uh, numbers, imports are down 40% compared to last year. So it's a pretty bad situation. Cuba is very dependent on imports for everything going from, you know, uh, uh, food to uh, uh, intermediate products, energy, and so on. So it's a, it's a very significant uh, 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 situation there. Then uh, there were already shortages of, of some basic goods and also kind of a selective default to providers and creditors. All of this, as I said before, the pandemic hit the country. Um, so the economy was already quite weak. That's the main, that's the main point. Of course, if we go back almost 30 years to 90, you know, 90 uh, situation, it's still relatively manageable. But especially in terms of imports, we are approaching a, a, a critical point. Uh, and, I hope uh, the rest of the year, the second semester, it's, it's better, but so far it's been quite, uh, quite bad. And then there are three weaknesses, in my opinion, that uh, Cuba inherited from the previous situation, and in my opinion, are shaping how the country can respond to, to, to the pandemic. One is we still have a quite primitive IT infrastructure. And for instance, that's been an issue in terms of remote working is uh, an or, uh, online uh, education or shopping. Uh, so so it, there's been improvements uh, in the last uh, few years, but it's still, you know, the infrastructure is not uh, good enough yet to allow, you know, the, the, the deployment, all of those uh, uh, options. So there have been attempts to uh, put, you know, to put together some online shopping, but then both the supply and, 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 and logistics have, uh, have been, have had issues. 
So that's something that we have to look at definitely as the country moves forward. The, the, the second thing is uh, food production. So this is, is a very old topic. I won't say a lot about it. Truth is that uh, despite uh, the actualization started in 2008 uh, in agriculture, and there was a lot of discussion about uh, reforms and, and you know, um, giving land to either land to, to, to farmers and cooperatives, we are not producing nearly enough to feed ourselves. And now with, with the disruption in global value chains and, and trade, we are feeling the pain. And then over reliance on, on Venezuela and, and, and tourism, uh, that's also well known. And so I'll go back to the tourism issue uh, later on in my, in my presentation. <laughs> this is just to see how it's essentially from 2015, growth rates have been down. And this is a projection, a very conservative one, I have to say, uh, for, for 2020. And it's, it's, it's going to be very bad. I mean, comparable to the contraction that we had in 91. Of course, we had several years of contraction back then. Hopefully, that would not be the case right now. But just to point out that this is but it's a very bad situation. And as I said, the, the economy was already pretty weak. This is in the, 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 the numbers for trade. Numbers for 2020 are estimates. I would say also very conservative ones, just to highlight how those numbers have been down for the last four years. And, um, you know, there are several factors to that. I, I won't go into the details. You can see them from Venezuela's economic crisis to U.S. sanctions and the, uh, you know, disappointing results of, of, of our domestic report. Um, you know, you, you, you are seeing the, the presentation. Uh, let me highlight just a few, a, a few points here. One is, um, you know, some of our uh, exports have been hit by the disruption in, in, in global trade. Cuba is very dependent, I would say, you know, we have three fishers now that are quite, uh, uh, I mean, make us vulnerable, uh, weak. Uh, to the to the to the current situation, you know, one is um, we are very dependent on on, on tourism, which is being badly hit because of the closures and, and the closed borders, and second, we are very dependent also on remittances um, coming from rich countries, especially uh, mostly United States, and when the economic situation you know gets uh, bad there. You know, people will have less to send to uh, their family in Cuba. So that's, and then we are also quite dependent on distant trading partners. Uh, we'll, with the probably exception of, 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 of Venezuela, all of our major trading partners are quite uh, distant. And again, given the disruption in global trade, uh, it, it's, it means something for, uh, for Cuba. Cuba is not a member of any major international financial institution, only the Central American uh, Development Bank. We are looking forward to see how that institution helps Cuba, um, you know, throughout this uh, situation. And another very small bank that is, my opinion, is not, is not very relevant when it comes to the amount of resources that we may get from them. And one, the strategy to recover the economy uh, back in the early 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union was based on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the fact that the world economy was growing uh, at that time. So the collapse of the Soviet Union didn't mean a lot for the, for the international economy. But this is not the case right now. So all countries eventually are in recession. So we have to pay attention to that when we conceive our way out of this. So Cuba's handling of the, of the pandemic. You know, most of these are well known to, to, to all of you. Just want to highlight that the, countries have, the country has some strengths, undeniable in my opinion. Um, you know, I'm, I'm showing some, 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 some numbers here. Um, and then there were some weaknesses. One is a lack of resources, you know, to buy enough tests and, and even treatments and medicines. Um, we have some trouble with law enforcement. It seems to me that we Cubans have almost a genetic incapacity to abide by the law for a long period of time. And so we are seeing that you know, the lack of discipline to follow the rules that have been 
uh, put forward to deal with the pandemic. Not, not, not saying that all the blame is on the people. I'm not saying that, but um, that's something even uh, as in even part of our culture that we have to, 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 to look at. And, and, and then, you know, the word three faces, you know, lots of uh, different things as part of them. I think for the ordinary citizen, that was quite difficult to understand, you know, who, you know, how many Cubans are going to read the, 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 that document that is almost 40 pages long and, and, and then, you know, follow through all the rules and prescriptions there. Uh, it's nearly impossible. So, and also the government somehow assumed some in terms of the recovery. So the number of cases will always be decreasing, you know, uh, monotonically. That is not the case. So we are seeing a recent spike in, in, in the number of cases. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't say, though, that Cuba has had, that we are, that we are in the midst of a health crisis. Um, you know, there's been a discussion about the, you know, how good Cuban numbers are and so on. I live in Cuba. I have neighbors. I've got family here. I've got colleagues, you know, spread all over the country. My family is from Villa Clara. It's not from Havana, actually. There isn't a health crisis in Cuba. Uh, so I think so far, it's, it's fair to say that uh, Cuba has been quite successful uh, dealing with the, uh, with, the, with the pandemic. This is a, a, a fantastic, in my opinion, work done by Oxford uh, University in the UK. They essentially have created you know, how countries have responded to, uh, um, uh, to the pandemic. Well, you, you can see the colors there in the legend that you know, Cuba is, uh, has applied some of the most strictest uh, 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 measures uh, during these uh, months. Um, that is not necessarily a guarantee for success, but I would say it's, it's a big step towards. <laughs> Uh, now, the economy. Uh, one of my uh, uh, concerns is not only Cuba, I mean worldwide, has been this tendency by some people to uh, uh, present the policy options in terms of a trade-off between health, people's health, and the economy. I think it's wrong, it's a wrong approach. We are seeing it in Cuba. Uh, fortunately, I I'm seeing some change in the government's you know, uh, discourse uh, in terms of this. So more recently, I'm, I'm seeing that they do say that we also have to pay attention to the economy. I think it's a wrong trade-off, it's artificial, and in the medium to the long term, it's, 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 it's not good to uh, focus on one you know, over the other. I think uh, we have to, come to, to, to put forward strategies, alternatives that take into account both uh, things because both are important for every country. And I would say especially for Cuba. You know, these are the things that the government has been, has been doing. I think the biggest impact so far has been on services. Uh, that is clearly, you know, the city is almost unrecognizable uh, 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 these days. And I have to say that the private sector has been badly hit uh, because of the closures and the confinement and, and, and so on. And now Havana is back to the, to the, to the uh, pre-recovery phase because of the spike in cases. And you know, all most uh, 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 businesses are closed again. So that is, that is very bad, and well, of course, increased rationing. Um, internationally, I mean, um, our balance of payments already had big troubles, and of course, the 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 the, the, the you know fall in, in 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 arrivals, you know, international visitors, you know, tourism is one of the key sectors in Cuba, also remittances and so on. So, we we had to go through. A kind of a quick negotiation with the creditors, our creditors in the Paris Club, and they offered some, you know, relief until early 2021. But after that, there, there have to be a, a, a negotiation to see how it goes from there. And and 
you know, the result of this is something that we'll see as part of the package, uh, you know, how the government has responded to, to, to the current situation, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the increase in the usage of the U.S. dollar uh, in the transactions within, in transactions within the country. Uh, policy options. Um, as I said, you know, somehow we've been very dependent on, on tourism for growth in the last uh, few years. You know, just to say one, you know, just to use one, one example, you know, more than a third of, 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 of all investments in the country have gone to uh, tourism and particularly building a big uh, kind of a luxury hotels in the last, at least since 2016. And, and you know, all that, all that money that is, is sunk there, now fair return and a good return out of that. So I think, of course, you know, out of that, the economy will feel the pain for many years to come. It is very uncertain, the, 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 the situation when it comes to uh, international visitors. Um, we don't know what, you know, when it's gonna happen actually, and then how long will it take to regain the numbers that we had before? U.S. relations, uh, you know, from bad to worse. Um, if you include everything that can be said or can be named as a flow between the two countries, the U.S. is Cuba's at least third or fourth largest trading partner. So any change in policy impacts Cuba in many, in many different ways. We are very exposed to events of that type, and we are very vulnerable. That's the reality. And as I said, uh, the situation is not going to get better uh, in, the next, uh, in, in, in the next few months. I would bet that the opposite is what is going to happen. And, you know, uh, the previous presentation talked a little bit about uh, Cuba's uh, medical missions overseas. I mean, in a way, we can think, uh, we can think of this as a golden opportunity. Uh, I was looking at some numbers and almost half of Cuba's exports last year were related to human and health uh, services, tourism, medical services, and so on. We also produce some, some, some medicines, treatments. Um, if the pandemic means a country will pay more attention and resources eventually to public health, or there might be a window of opportunity for Cuba. I do agree though that we'll have to revise some of the protocols and, and, and the, the way uh, our physicians and health personnel is deployed overseas. Uh, there is a big controversy out of that, but uh, from the standpoint that that could be an opportunity for all the people and, and the country if done well. Uh, and that if is very powerful, uh, that if. Uh, these days. Um, well, a big discussion going on in the country as of uh, food uh, inputs and, you know, growing more uh, crops in the country and being able to produce more of our food. Um, but, but that's, again, a very old discussion. And uh, the thing about ICT networks now, the pandemic has shown us very clearly why they are so important for 21st uh, century development. Uh, the government announced uh, the kind of uh, areas for change in, on, on, on July 16th. Um, quickly, very quickly, you know, uh, dollarization in the economy uh, advancing as a direct result of the current state of Cuba's uh, balance of payments. Um, well, there is uh, at least in the discourse its intention to expand further the private and cooperative sectors. Uh, we don't know the details yet. I think that's been discussed, but it's very likely that we'll see kind of a negative lift. They already have been granted access to foreign trade. A wholesale market is being created. So I think overall, those are very positive news for, 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 for that uh, sector. And then we don't know the details about other important areas like agriculture, so or even more important, uh, monetary and exchange rate uh, reform. Uh, I think, again, overall, these are very positive steps in the right direction. Most of them long overdue. Many of us have been talking for a long time about all of this. I think, it, you know, uh, one interesting fact 
that I want to highlight about dollarization these days is that it is happening in a way that provides access to foreign capitals, to, foreign, to, to capital goods by the private sector, by cooperatives and so on, potentially. I think that's very interesting because there is no economic recovery, there is no long-term development without investment and access to capital goods. I think that's very important in my opinion. I think it was an act of, of political pragmatism. The situation was bad enough and so something was needed to be, uh, to be done. But there are some social costs. You know, not all Cubans have access to uh, uh, dollars. I think the big winner so far is the United States sectors have been vindicated and legitimized in many ways. I think we have to pay attention to how this, at least these three things uh, um, uh, develop over the coming uh, months. Well, the words I mentioned about the state-owned uh, SMEs, it's a big question mark for me uh, around that. It is unclear how the government is, uh, wants to reform, again, state companies, and as I said, the currency reform. With that, thank you all, and I look forward to the questions at the very end of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo, uh, for an excellent presentation. Um, you have a, a number of interesting questions and answers that I have been lifting for you later on. And our next presenter, <laughs> our next presenter is in Spain, in Valencia. So you're listening to people who are, you know, in Philadelphia, in Cuba, in Valencia, and that is Elias Amor Bravo. Elias is Cubano Español, as I uh, highlighted before, and he is professor of economics at the Universidad ESIC -E -E Business School in Valencia, in Spain. He's also the president of the Observatorio Cubano de Derechos Humanos. He is among the most active economists in the analysis of the Cuban economic crisis and its potential resolution in both English and Spanish. He is a member of Convivencia, which is a grassroots effort within Cuba of civil society, and of the Felix Varela Center at the Universidad Francisco de Vitoria in Madrid. He is serving also as president of the Unión Liberal Cubana. Among the books he has authored are, back in uh, 2010, Economía Cubana, La Oportunidad Perdida, The Cuban Economy, The Lost Opportunity, Editorial Aduana Vieja, and more recently, 2020, Editorial Infante, Economia Cubana, 2009 to 2019. He serves as a collaborator on economic themes with Cyber Cuba, Diario de Cuba, Catorce y Medio, Radio Martí, Televisión. Elias. Thank you very much, my dear Presidenta, Silvia. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, webinar, to this conference of uh, the ASCII, uh, it's my first participation in these uh, events and uh, before uh, in 2008 when we celebrated here in Valencia a meeting uh, of, the, um, of the association and um, for this occasion I have uh, selected a subject which I consider very important for the Cuban uh, return to normality uh, after the COVID-19 and is basically the role of the private entrepreneurs, the Cuban private entrepreneurs, what we call cuenta propistas in Spanish, in Cuban, in Cuban Spanish. And is one of the most important features of the Cuban economy right now. I should say that it is difficult to understand the Cuban economy in the last five years if we are not able to explain the role, the ambitions, and the projections of these people who are developing entrepreneurial projects in Cuba with enormous difficulties against the regime and with a lot of effort that we don't see in any other country in the world. And besides, this people not only is developing with enormous efforts, uh, they are small business in many sectors, basically in the service sectors, but also they suffer continuously 
the high pressure of the government, of the communist government, which is sometimes interested, sometimes is not interested in the development of these um, economic projects. I should remember to the participants in this session that in Cuba, private entrepreneurs practically disappear after what we call La Ofensiva Revolucionaria of 1968. In that time, I was very young. I was just a child of uh, nine years old. And one day I, re I recognized with that age that the things that I used to buy every day in one shop, that day disappear because the owner of the shop was imprisoned. That was the result of the Ofensiva Revolucionaria in 1968. And since then, although in the informal economy existed, people who were developed to private activities, the, basically the basic structure of the Cuban economy was a state and centrally planned. Private entrepreneurs disappeared in the economic in the economy of Cuba since 1968. And when Raul Castro decided to introduce them after 2008, 60, for, sorry, 40 years later, in just one year, the rise of people with the objective of creating a private project, a private entrepreneur, a private business, in Cuba exploded. It experimented a tremendous growth in just one or two years and the government decided to stop it because the, from the very beginning the creation of private firms in Cuba has been very conditioned, very controlled by the authorities. They don't want the free economy in Cuba. They don't want the private economy in Cuba. And the government fights against these private entrepreneurs for limiting their growth, for example, in agriculture, for uh, avoiding their participation in industry, in manufacturing, or in health and education, which are the basic services provided by the regime. According to this, I decided to develop a paper that you have in the web page of the association, sorry, is in Spanish, but probably you can read it. Um, and this paper is basically a dialogue, a intention of dialogue between one economist and the government of Cuba. I imagine a situation, a theoretical situation in which I could be heard by the government authorities with responsibilities in terms of economic policy and try to explain them in this paper why it is very important to promote private entrepreneurs, why it is very important to give them help to be success in the fight against COVID-19 and try to explain what is the most important policy strategy to be developed in Cuba with private entrepreneurs, with cuenta propistas, with the only objective of taking guarantees for them to survive to this tremendous economic crisis, which was presented before by my colleagues, basically by Ricardo, which presented the basic signs of the economic crisis in Cuba right now. I will not go ahead with them. My, my idea is to, uh, to propose 10, pro 10 proposals to the authorities for promoting the development of private entrepreneurs. 10 proposals which are easily conducted in terms of economic policy in Cuba. I am not demanding free elections. I am not demanding a change of regime. Just only measures of economic policy to protect the most important feature 
of the Cuban economy right now, which, I, which are the private entrepreneurs, los cuentapropistas. If one of them are paying attention right now to my presentation, excuse me, I will use, voy a utilizar mi idioma español para trasladarles a todos ellos un cariñoso saludo y todo mi apoyo en, a nivel internacional. And said this, what are my proposals? You have them in my paper. My proposals are basically fiscal, economic, and um, administrative proposals. I think most of them are easy to develop by the government right now. For example, the first one, the reduction of pre fiscal pressure and social security. It is not, a, it is not only a matter of uh, uh, substituting taxes or a replacement of taxes and social security. It is a matter of if you are not developing activity and you are not obtaining incomes, the government reduces taxes and reduces social security costs to private entrepreneurs. And this is a very important idea which could be easily developed by the government. The only thing they have to do is to reduce the expenses in the budget, in the central government budget, expensive, which are not social or economic interesting. I propose to the government to, uh, gave, to, give, to give subsidies to the uh, state firms, but not for sustaining prices, which is the traditional instrument in the government in Cuba for uh, subsi subsidizing firms. The idea is to subsidize employment and training of workers because it is very important for ICT technologies and for the transformation of the economies. In Cuba, for example, the authorities are talking, uh, are speaking about informatization. They are not talking about digitalization. There is a tremendous difference between these two terms. Informatization is something that we have done many years ago. Uh, what we have to do right now is digitalization. In Cuba, it, they are talking about informat informatization, right? It's, it's a different concept. You will have to invest resources in the training of workers. Be, yes, they say Cuba is a, a high level of qualifications of the population right now. But if you speak with the Spanish entrepreneurs investing in Cuba, they will tell you that workers are not qualified. They are very well formed and trained with diplomas in university, but they are not qualified for developing the tasks in the productive system. This is a very important issue for the government too. The third idea is to develop um, financial aid. Uh, why we have a banking system controlled, uh, controlled by the state in Cuba? Well, we can use this banking system for giving support to private entrepreneurs in terms of low credits with lower interest rates with uh, every kind of um, financial head financial aid to these uh, organizations for example i propose the reform of the process of licenses uh, when i wrote this paper this idea was not uh, on the on the on the arena like right now the other day the Social Security Minister of Cuba uh, talk about the elimination of the licenses for the private entrepreneurs. Very good idea. It is easy to be developed by the government. Another idea to be developed by the government, the juridic framework. Uh, we cannot talk about private entrepreneurs in Cuba if they are not juridic, they, they have not a juridic recognition. It is very important to operate in terms of debts in terms of uh, commitments, in terms of agreements, not only with other um, institutions in Cuba, but also with foreign institutions to have this juridic uh, personality and um, a framework to respect the juridic institutions of the country. This is a very important issue also. More market for assigning resources. There is another proposal on the arena related to the uh, create um, and markets for uh, distributors in Cuba, for logistics. So I think that this is a very important issue, also easily developed by the government if they want to develop and you want to put into motion. 
association between uh, different organizations of private entrepreneurs. This is a very important idea. If we create associations, not by the government, but not by the government, but the owners of the business, these associations will promote their ideas and will defend their proposals against the government. And I think it's very important that uh, to promote import and exports. This is a recent measure by Malmierka, who said that there is a, a policy right now in order to promote uh, imports and exports by uh, uh, private entrepreneurs. Nothing more to say. The government can develop it. And the 10, the number 10 is the increase of uh, the, uh, the purchasing of state firms with private entrepreneurs. Many operations should help uh, to these private firms, very small and with a limited capacity to grow, uh, to obtain resources in order to uh, increase their scale of operations. So these 10 proposals are very important, but I think that at, at the end of my presentation, that the most important one is the dialogue. What I mean with dialogue, you will read it in my paper. The government in Cuba needs to dialogue with the associations of private entrepreneurs. The private entrepreneurs look at the economy in a different way than the government. The government has its position, but the private association of entrepreneurs has another definition of economy. Their voice has to be heard by the authorities and many of the ideas that these private entrepreneurs should propose to the government have a lot of impact on the future of the Cuban economy. For example, the high dependence of tourism should be replaced by the dependence of internal tourism. Spain, which is one of the most important countries of the world in terms of tourism, is suffering this year because of the COVID-19 effect on tourism at the international level. But the Spaniards this year are moving to the hotels which were traditionally occupied by international foreigners. We were coming to Spain in summer in order to spend uh, the holidays because prices have been lowered in order to obtain clients for hotels which were empty. This idea is also explained or explored, sorry, in Italy and also in France. Why do the government in Cuba is not in conditions to exploit this idea. Why not to promote an internal market for tourism in Cuba? Is, is it not possible? I think that it is. The only thing you have to do is to clear where the resources have to be from. And the budget in Cuba, the state and the central budget in Cuba, is full of expenditures which have no any result on the economy, particularly on the private economy. If the government is able to canalize these resources, which are directed to many uh, items and programs, which I, it's very difficult to, to refer them here in this presentation, we obtain resources for promoting economic activity. And the economic activity is basically, has to be basically private because 61 years of state controlled and centrally planned economy have shown the failure of the original project of the so-called revolution. It's time to introduce a new achievement for the development of a Cuban economy. And I think that private entrepreneurs is the most important um, field in this moment, feature in this moment of a Cuban economy for, develop, for developing this transition and transformation of the economy, which is necessary for the well-being of the Cubans and for the quality of life and the level of um, incomes of the Cuban society as a whole. For this reason, in my paper, I propose to the government several ideas to speak with private entrepreneurs. Many of these ideas, you can read them in my paper. And uh, basically, they conclude in one point, and I, would, and I am ending with this. It is the time to put an end to the 
unilateral decisions by the communist government. In Cuba, it is necessary to incorporate the different sectors of the society, basically in the economy, to the decision making by the authorities. If the real government, if the government of Cuba is able to, to make this step beyond, in order to reformulate the process of uh, elaboration, preparation of economic policy, I think that many things can change in Cuba and the private sector and the private entrepreneurs and los cuentapropistas, which is one, the most important thing of the Cuban economy right now, I, I don't see any other aspect in Cuba as important as this one, uh, will have succeed, will probably recover from the tremendous damage which is suffering from the disattention of the government authorities during the pandemic. And uh, I think at the end, we shall have a very different Cuban economy that we have right now. I don't know how this economy will be, but I am completely sure that it will be much better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Elias. That was a wonderful presentation and your English is better than I imagined. <laughs> uh, I have been collecting a lot of questions and answers. Let me see, one more just came in, just to make sure that I don't ignore. Uh, okay, and, and so I, let me give you some of the issues that have been raised. One first comment for Elias, in your paper you discuss the possibility, one solution to the economic crisis at, and health crisis at, pre at present would be a collaboration between the private and the public, between the private self-employed people and the government state sector. And I'm wondering if you could give examples of that. Um, and uh, one of the other people who wrote a question in was also interested in this issue, and particularly with respect to the health sector. Is there such a thing as a private health clinic in Cuba? I think not, but you are the one who, who can say if, if such a collaboration would be possible in the health sector. And then there is a, a skeptical comment from uh, our friend um, Yvonne Grenier saying that he wonders if any of these possibilities for government policies that you discuss are possible without regime change. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that that's a question that sort of answered itself but <laughs> but anyway if you can address right. that. private public private public cooperation is something that the european union for example is constantly urging to countries in europe for example eastern countries which were communist develop private public cooperation in many fields in cuba uh, for example, we were talking before about the quality of the water. Why don't we use private firms for providing the water services and sanitation services in cities? This happens in many countries in the world, for example, in Spain and, and so on. We also have a tremendous field to be developed in health sector. In Spain, we have a private pu public-private cooperation in the health sector and of course in the education sector in education sector we have the colegios concertados most of them belong to the catholic church and these are the best quality schools in spain for kids so also we can develop this kind of strategies in cuba and at the same time that you are developing this public and private cooperation you are reducing the expenditures of the budget because you don't need so much money to produce the public services because they are provided by private institutions. This is the, the most important issue that the Cuban government has to think about. In fact, in Cuba, we found this model in the development of the tourism sector. The buildings of the tourists in Cuba, the hotels, are state owned by the country and the services are provided by Spanish hotel companies. So this is the private and public cooperation that uh, is interesting for the Cuban government, but I am talking about the public and private cooperation, which must be interesting for the 
human citizens. And the other idea, uh, my proposals are 10, is a decalogue, and I have studied all of them in order to be implemented without the necessity of transforming the economic and political institutions in Cuba. These 10 proposals should be developed by Alejandro Diaz, the Minister of Economy of Cuba, or the Minister of Social Security, or Alejandro Malmierca, the, the responsible of uh, uh, international investments. The only thing they have to do is to have the political responsibility to implement these measures. Many thanks, many thanks. Very good answer, yeah. Elias. Uh, there is another set of questions and I think I'm gonna give them to Ricardo Torres. Um, uh, with respect to the economic crisis, Robert Kuling says, to increase agricultural production, will it be necessary to improve agricultural infrastructure? Uh, this is also of concern to Mario Gonzalez Corso. Will fertilizer, pesticides, farming equipment, transportation and distribution infrastructure be necessary? If so, how will it be financed? The Cuban government does not seem to have the resources to provide those items. Foreign companies are restricted from direct ownership of land and facilities in Cuba, so they have limited motivation to invest there. How do you think agricultural infrastructure can be improved? Okay, so may I answer or? Yes, yes, it's for you. I gave you that oh, okay. one. <laughs> Um, well, you know, the question, uh, I'm not an expert on agriculture. I'm more like a macroeconomist, like uh, looking at the, at the economy from a more uh, um, macro perspective. But I, you know, in general, it's, it's very interesting how the discussion about agriculture in Cuba has evolved over the years. And, but I want to say that, you know, very, very often, uh, I see in Cuba a, a, a line of analysis about agriculture connecting disappointing results with lack of resources, investment resources and so on, inputs and so on. Uh, now, I think uh, resources, of course, are important. And if we look at the numbers, there is a large underinvestment in agriculture um, you know, building up in Cuba over the years. But in my opinion, this is a two-tier, uh, so we need a two-tier approach. So whereas on one hand, uh, it's important that we mobilize resources, both domestic and international, to increase uh, capital spending and, and investment in agriculture. At the same time, I think it's important to accompany that process with institutional reform. That goes from uh, the ownership structure in agriculture to the way uh, farmers, uh, you know, private farmers and cooperatives connect to uh, the market. You know, how the way they distribute the products, the, the way those products are storage and, and so on. Um, because what may happen, and this is something that has happened in Cuba already, is that if we increase investment without institutional reforms, those investments will produce very little resources, very, very little results. So we saw that in the 70s and during the 80s. So, you know, uh, total factor productivity in agriculture, you know, several studies have shown that was very low, even negative at that time. So there were lots of resources available, but the uh, of their usage was very low. So again, my point being, uh, it's important to find new ways for Cuba's banking and financial system to uh, fund and uh, to mobilize savings to increase investment in agriculture. But at the same time, I would rather start with institutional reform. I think meaningful institutional reform can produce lots of resources. Uh, without a comparable increase in the amount of, uh, of, of resources invested in agriculture. So, and, and sometimes what we see here is that 
uh, the lack of resources is used even as, a, as an excuse to justify you know, low output and, 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 and so on. So that's my uh, take on, on that. So let, let me say that we don't have, again, the details of what is gonna be, uh, what is gonna be done in terms of Cuba's agricultural sector uh, in the coming months. It's been, you know, th there is uh, almost unanimous consensus in Cuba that something big and radical needs to be done in, in the sector. Uh, but for instance, it was very interesting to me uh, to listen to the president and the, and the economy minister, the economic minister, um, uh, to say that they are thinking about uh, uh, creating a bank specialized in agriculture and directing resources towards it. I hope that in that process they also in, include international cooperation not only in terms of resources, but also in terms of technical uh, expertise that is definitely needed in that area in, in, in Cuba. So that will, be, that will be it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And the next question I'm going to give, of course, to Yuri and Larry, um, and it's from Natalia Delgado. She says, can you comment on what opportunities for developing the Cuban economy you see from Cuba's experience in managing the pandemic and experience of the international medical brigades to which Yuri referred. Omar Berleni and David Pajon have written on the subject briefly. And as you are an economist, I would like to hear your ideas on how Cuba could use this as an opportunity for economic development. Um, and I, I think that this is a question that I would love to hear Ricardo's views on as well. So okay. um, Yuri and I can, can speak briefly to it. And then if Ricardo okay. can also add uh, at his own sense. Um, it's, and, and this sounds terrible, but it, it, it seems to be the way of the world in the early 21st century. Um, crises expose both weaknesses and opportunities. And here, um, the weaknesses and opportunities have been extraordinarily exposed in Cuba's case. Um, and and we, we spoke about it very briefly, but, but I think one of them is that the government's insistence over the last generation in turning tourism into the sugar uh, monoculture from the 1950s um, is proving to be disastrous, as disastrous as the post-1959 government talked about the um, dependence on uh, sugar monocultures. Uh, tourism uh, appears to be the same problem. And so for, for Cuba to move ahead better, they're going to need a much more heavy emphasis on diversification. Uh, we understand why tourism is important. It's linked to the, uh, the privatization of the state sector. Um, uh, todo el mundo con la mano afuera, you know, everyone with the, the propina. Uh, and it, it, but it, it is still extraordinarily dangerous. So they're going to have to revise the tourist sector. On the other hand, as controversial as it is, the export of human power and the continued development in the tech sector are probably areas where Cuba might be able to move relatively quickly, especially if they could solidify their relationships with their friends in Spain and their friends in China. China has proven to be the elephant in the room here in Cuban economic development, because while it is really good in saying the right things, the rate and extent of its economic friendship has yet proven to be, has, has yet to be proven. And so it'd be interesting to see how, how that would, would operate. Uh, Cuban educational reform that started in the second decade of the uh, 20th of the 21st century would probably need uh, stronger looking at. Um, there were reasons why the Raul government went more towards the globalized uh, format away from political education to technical education. But there, like in Western countries, um, there, there has to be a look at and a better targeting of that kind of thing. And then ultimately, um, uh, Cuba's relations with Europe uh, will likely uh, will likely shape 
some of uh, Cuba's opportunities. And again, most of this uh, goes back to the fundamental issue. For Cuba to do anything, it's going to need capital and it's going to need markets. Even if, and, and of course, and that leads to my last point, which is the fundamental issue that the Cuban government is going to have to confront is that the issue of continuing to view Cuba as two countries, completely or as substantially isolated inside against penetration from outside economic forces, except through the state and state um, and, and state kind of porous walls versus an energetic Cuban engagement, increasing engagement externally in, uh, in global production and global trade. Um, until that issue is revisited and, re and, and reconstructed, the issue of, of um, capital inflows uh, beyond the couple of pennies that millions of people provide their own people through remittances is going to remain an issue. So that's, that's all I got. Yeah, I'm just adding a, a little bit about the Professor Becker says and, and Elias was talking about. If the Cuba government just be focused on take a desperate decision, will be decreasing another uh, important uh, social uh, field. Because when they are talking about tourism, they, they have been focused just on that. And that was the decreasing the education because all the teachers just moving to work to the, for the tourists because they made more money. So that was making worse the education in Cuba. Uh, it's the same now when they are sending out, doc out doctors. So, the Cuban doctor always have been working because they have this vocation, they are professional. So now they are seeing that uh, abroad, they can make a little more money. So they have been changed the way to offer the medical service. So that have made the pressure, the, the professionalism of the Cuban doctor because sending doctor abroad, they have to uh, force the production of doctors. So not everyone can be a good doctor. Not everyone can be a good professional. So if you are trying to develop another kind of economical field in Cuba, you have to be concerned the consequence that the people that you are uh, giving a new education, they, are, they have not the same professional that form the first uh, part of the people. So right now, Cuba is in this position. We don't have good professional to develop in new professionals. So these people that we have now, in a near future, they won't be there. So we have to be concerned what we are creating now to, to get good results in the future. So that's why the Cuba need to diversify and give in other hand the responsibility to create new economical fields and, and to, to develop new um, and, and the society in within the society new ways to develop professionals and also uh, in economical fields. Many thanks Yuri, uh, excellent uh, reply. And I wanna just briefly say that I am always fond to point out to people that in China, in order to write the word crisis, you need two characters. And one character means opportunity and the other one means danger. And I think that one of the themes that runs through all of these presentations is that the COVID-19 is a crisis but in both senses. It is a great danger to everybody and to the Cuban people in particular, but it should also be an opportunity for change. Um, we have another interesting uh, issue here raised by Mario Gonzalez Corso. He says that to attract foreign direct investment, either from small or medium enterprises or large multinational corporations, so foreign direct investment, domestic economic actors must have the economic freedom to enter legally binding contracts without the type of direct state interference proposed by Malmierca. 
It is disingenuous to believe that foreign investors and the incipient domestic private sector could rely on inefficient state-run IMEX firms to serve as intermediaries. For close to six decades, these state-run IMEX firms have shown their inability to perform the basic functions that privately owned firms are able to perform in capitalist market-based economies. I think this question belongs to Elias. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much. It's a very interesting question, I think. In my opinion, uh, the most important thing of all is to put into motion these measures of flexibility. Instead of criticizing them or uh, uh, offering alternatives, which are also very important and rational, I think that the most important thing of all is that for the first time in many years, private entrepreneurs in Cuba have the possibility of import and export, although with these uh, intermediate agencies that I consider as uh, the person who has made this question, which are not efficient. And in whatever case, I think that, in my opinion, of course, this kind of intermediate agencies are going to be disappearing with the passing of time as the business between the private entrepreneurs and the foreigners become more and more important. Because this kind of intermediate organizations generally depend on the government and they have no idea of what the business is. So the most important thing is that the Cuban economy be reinforced with this kind of policy measures. And I defend this idea of import and export, although it might be obliged right now by means of an intermediate association of the government, which is an instrument for uh, obtaining uh, dollars uh, for the Cuban economy, dollars and euros. But with the passing of the time, I think that norma normality in the economic relations will make this kind of intermediate associations disappear. I am completely sure about this. Good. Thank you very, very much. Uh, there is a question here that I like a lot because it has to do with Rotary International and all my family members and I uh, have been members of Rotary International. It's from Andrea Washington. She says, from my experience, private groups such as Rotary International play a pivotal role in supporting the government and engaging in dialogue. Many Rotary clubs are comprised of both government and private sector individuals. Additionally, they often seek to address public health concerns, either within the host country or abroad. Is there a role for a Rotary Club in Cuba? Um, I know what Elias will say about that. How about Larry? It's, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> I've, I've seen the way Rotary works, for example, in the special administrative regions in China, in right. Macau, in Hong Kong. And I've seen how they are actually quite sensitive to the political realities of a particular place and can work quite vigorously. Um, but China doesn't, China's context for appreciating, I'm trying to say this tactfully, China's context for appreciating the role and nature of Rotary will be different than that in Cuba who will tend to, I believe, view international organizations like Rotary with substantially more suspicion than countries like China or Vietnam. And I think that changes everything. Yes, there's a long tradition of this kind of institutions to the service of the society in Cuba. In Cuba, there were Rotaries, Leones. My grandfather was a member of the Leones in La Habana in the 40s of the, of the last century. And, and I think these organizations were suppressed uh, by the regime. Con uh, concretely, I think Rotarians were uh, prohibited in 1979. So uh, the existence of this kind of organizations, uh, which are in all countries in the world, is also a typical feature of the uh, unreality of the Cuban regime, you know? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very and much. Also, and also talking about organization, it's happened because even when 
they say that we are, are, we are, for example, an NGO, we have to respond to the government. Because I, I, I in the past, belonged to the Bufete Colectivo NGO, is the organization that every lawyer belongs in Cuba. But as an NGO, we have to follow the rules of the government so we don't have uh, an autonomy uh, rule and we all have to give the we need to advise on everything from the government so even when you are an ngo you are not alone you, you have to follow what they said and what is the the the, the plan for that ngo in that year thank you Thank you. Uh, Yuri, one of my Puerto Rican friends calls that type of NGO a gongo, which means a government organized, non-government organization. <laughs> but uh, Puerto Ricans know about things like that. Uh, the, let's see, we have a lot of other interesting questions. Uh, Jorge Perez Lopez has a question for Ricardo. He says, is it realistic to expect that Cuba will do away with the positive list for self-employment altogether or to expect a larger list that begins to include some highly skilled jobs? Is the possibility of medical doctors running their own practices in the cards? May I answer? Yes, it's yours. From Jorge Perez. Okay, Lopez. so, yeah, well, Jorge Perez Lopez. Uh, uh, well, you know, the first part, well, we don't know for sure what is what is going to happen. You know, a recent uh, a speech by the Minister of uh, Work and Social Security uh, at uh, National Television, she indicated, and I think that was something that everyone understood this way, she indicated that the government is planning to get rid of the list, list, uh, you know, the categories, the limited number of categories where people can engage in as a private uh, entrepreneur. Uh, we don't know the details. We don't know what is going to happen. I have to say, you know, maybe to add a little bit of a positive uh, note to, 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 to the panel that um, I do see a shifting in the discussion in Kiva towards the private sector. Uh, you may say that it's out of necessity. Well, whatever the, the reason is, I see that uh, happening right now. And I think it's more likely now than it's ever been. Um, so I look forward to it. Uh, I think uh, something important is, is going to happen around the private sector. Um, so, and we are pushing for that very strongly uh, because uh, we believe that it's very, it's, it's critical for the country's uh, success and its ability to get out of this uh, uh, current crisis. No, the second part of it is connected to the, to the question. Well, that is more sensitive, frankly speaking. Uh, you know, healthcare and education are two, uh, the two cores of the revolution. And Frank, you know, I don't, I don't find a consensus in Cuban society about, you know, privatizing healthcare or something, even partially. So what, what is more likely to happen, in my opinion, is that we see the private sector entering uh, healthcare and even education, but as a provider of support services. Um, you know, transport, uh, cleaning, you know, many, maybe manufacturing some, some stuff, uh, uh, that kind of things. I think that's likely to happen. And I, was, uh, I would add, hopefully, I'm not uh, being over, overly optimistic. But then allowing doctors and physicians, you know, you know health personnel in general to, to start private practices, frankly speaking, I don't see that happening in Cuba in the next uh, five years. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. Good, thank you very, very much. And I think I can combine three questions into one and for all of the panelists, and that will bring us to the end for today, uh, which has been very wonderful. And uh, one is from Gary May Barduk. He says, in many developing countries, much of the financing comes from supplier and buyer credit, often from abroad. 
do you see any possibility of the Cuban government permitting this? That's part one. Then from Lorenzo Perez, how likely is it that cuenta propistas will be allowed to export and import in Cuba? And then the third part from Saul Simbler, what is the reality probability of Cuba permitting investment by Cuban Americans? I don't see it in the horizon. Three parts, if you can. Uh, Ricardo, since I have you right here on the big screen, do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, well, you know, um, I think uh, Cuba's financial system, as I said, and the banking system needs an overhaul that is long overdue. And, and, you know, already that is something that is it's happening because and this goes, uh, you know, to the second question. Well, the government is planning to allow cooperatives and cuenta uh, to engage in foreign trade activities, both exports and imports. You know, the, 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 the legal documents are, 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 are about to be uh, released. So, and in that case, you know, if it's someone, you know, in Cuba, a cuenta you know, may want to import something, let's say capital stuff for, for its business, well, most likely we'll have to get some funding from whoever is available uh, out there, whether in Cuba or outside Cuba, most likely outside Cuba because foreign trade is, uh, is happening only in foreign currencies, foreign convertible uh, currencies. Um, so that is something that again is evolving uh, we'll see, you know, the big question mark for me is what is the scale of that? So it's going to be like a very small case by case approach or um, authorities will jump in and try to, again, um, uh, change the financial system in a way that allows for that to happen, even bringing foreign funds to, to, to that. You know, again, the second question is, uh, it's already, it's already uh, answered. So what was the third question quickly? Uh, what is the probability of Cuba permitting investment by Cuban Americans? Okay, yeah, very important. Um, well, the government says that it's not prohibited. It is just <laughs> not encouraged. That's what they say. Uh, no, that's what they say. That's the public, uh, that's the official position about the issue. My opinion, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time. My opinion is is very dependent on the political climate between the United States and Cuba. I mean, official relations. Right. At this point, unthinkable. Uh, uh, very, not very likely. Uh, but we don't know, you know, as, as we said, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And who knows? But I think, <laughs> again, <laughs> it's very sensitive to the political climate between the two countries and also you know, the Cuban community in the United States. I conclude with that. Uh, Larry and Judy, yeah. do you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, let, me, let, me add, let me add just one tiny point. Um, okay. Every time there's good news about foreign investment, one always forgets the nature of the Cuban bureaucracy, especially in the context of creating the forms, los formularios, el proceso, the reviews, and the management of these things. So it is one thing to say, yes, the private sector will be able to seek capital from outside. It's another thing to see, as they've done in the past, the 60 plus pages of single space regulations that will be developed and probably taken in a cut and paste way from the <laughs> kind of approval process that they already have for investment by large companies. Um, and then see just how they manage that because these kinds of things can be used. There's two ways that one can use these things. One, for its propaganda value. Aha, we're announcing this, it is there on paper. And the other is for its substantive value. That is, we're going to make the process of this efficient, either by capping it and then allowing it or, or something. But here my fear is that the, if, if uh, Cuba is, is true to form, they are likely to export into these new regimes a lot of the bureaucratic systems that they have already put in place for these kinds of transactions. And that may significantly impede, in reality, at least formal 
channels for the um, the uh, movement of capital into Cuba. That's that's my only point. Oh, um, I just want to add that that made me wonder how open will be the government, the Cuba government, to this, because sometimes I, I have been in both sides. I mean, I have been working for offices in this kind of bureaucracy, and I have been working with entrepreneurs. And sometimes there is not just about regulation, about status, it's sometimes, it's sometimes about how open the people who work to the government, they are allowed, they are, they are willing to move forward. So right now, I think that is the time for listening, to learn about everything. And I think that that, that is the main point because if they don't wanna learn about new possibility, new open doors, I don't think that we can move forward with all these great ideas. And that's happened with the entrepreneurs. We have been, I mean, when I say we, because I think that I have, I, I'm a kind of entrepreneurs. We have been 10 years stuck in the same uh, decision because since 2010, they open. They say, okay, propistas, you are allowed to do this activity, uh, worker disponible. So it's a kind of unemployment, but they, they find another name so you can make self-employed. But as Professor Becker says, there is the, the rule, but what we are allowed to do. So it's a kind of bridge between the reality and what you are allowed to do. So that is the scene. I I'm, I'm just want to think about how open they will be to really move forward, to really forget everything about it and think in develop, like a developing something. So. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Larry. Uh, your, Yuri's point about now is the time for the government to listen to the people is a very important one and it feeds well into Elias, and Elias gets to close our session. Go Thank ahead. you very much. Okay, well, uh, my friend Lorenzo, uh, un saludo muy grande, Lorenzo, querido amigo. Te contesto, <laughs> uh, I answer you. Uh, the question related with Malmierca measures, uh, you and I know that these measures are not serving for anything. The map developed for the formas uh, no estatales in all the country, you know that it's not serving for the purposes of importing and exporting, but it's a first step. And all the things that the Cuban government gives in the right direction, we have to uh, push them. We have to uh, extreme the importance of opening doors for private uh, operations, for private agents. It's a good idea. You know, the only thing we have to do is to, to expect that the decisions and the operations go in a good direction. Respect to the, uh, the, finance, the finance that uh, go to Cuba for investments, for, from my experience, uh, from Spaniards who go to Cuba to develop uh, investments in the country, they used to tell me that the bureaucratic uh, limitations, for example, that Larry explained before, are very important. But the most important thing of all is the lack of financial in the inner country. The lack of funds from the counterparts in Cuba for developing the investments. As you know, international investments go to a country where there is a lot of finance in order to develop this project. If you don't find finance, is this the case of Cuba, you cannot develop anything in the country. I don't have any information about Cuban Americans investment in Cuba, but I, lot, I know a lot of Cuban Espanoles, yeah. <laughs> like me, who, do, who are making investments in Cuba and are uh, reconstructing buildings and are opening offices and are developing a lot of activities in the country. And this is something that is happening every day. I am not going to do that, but I recognize that the freedom is precisely for every person to do what they want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody. Our time is more than up. I want to say Clary, Yuri, Ricardo, and Elias.
I want to thank all, particularly also Frank Carlos Martinez, who you're not seeing on the screen, but he has kept us, uh, you know, uh, helped us a great deal in this session. And all of the people who sent us very, very, very good questions and comments, we got to most of them. The papers will gradually go up on the website so that you will have more chances to read them and think about them. They're all very much worth reading and thinking about. Please continue to support ASCII and support us intellectually, support us emotionally, support us financially. And see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.